So uh, my name is Kevin Kopchinski. I run the planetarium. I do other uh, science education here at the Science Museum. Uh, we're joined by Mike Kerr, who is director of the Science Museum, and Richard Sanderson, president of the Springfield Stars Club, and Caitlin Goulet, member of the, of the Springfield Stars Club. Uh, so we're looking forward to bring you a nice program tonight. We'll start out with some um, observations and photographs from recent events from Caitlin and Rich. And then we'll move on to uh, exploring and learning about the James Webb Telescope and all the things that that has to show us, which is going to be quite a bit. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Rich Sand. Um, I'm sorry. First of all, we're going to start with Caitlin. So I'd like to introduce Caitlin Goulet. Uh, Caitlin's a member of the Springfield Stars Club. She is an active observer, user of telescope. And uh, Caitlin writes a great newsletter called the uh, Starry Scoop. Uh, and you can subscribe to that newsletter with a uh, email to starryscoop at gmail.com and you'll be on the list. So uh, Caitlin's going to uh, talk to us tonight about the constellation Taurus and some other stuff. So uh, Caitlin, take it away. So as Kevin did mention, I do write a monthly newsletter called the Starry Scoop. Um, it's a monthly astronomy space newsletter. Um, this is December's edition right here. I think I'm on uh, volume 21. So in April, I'll be on my two year anniversary, which is exciting. So my newsletter um, is comprised of uh, different sections. It has a what's up column, um, basically a re um, telling of the current events and historical astronomy space events. I have a calendar and a star map to show the readers what's going on in the sky. I have an observation section, which retells my own observations and other people I have interviewed. And I have an object of the month, um, which is a fun little challenge for the observers who read my newsletter. The object of the month for December was the Crab Nebula M1. Um, I will be discussing that tonight later. So tonight I'll be touring the constellation Taurus the Bull. Um, Taurus the Bull is one of the 80 official constellations in our sky. Now, I like to think of constellations as puzzle pieces. They each take up their specific area and fit together perfectly to create our entire celestial sphere. Now, astronomers recognize these constellations with their bright stars creating star patterns or asterisms. We have um, Taurus here. Now, we have some bright stars creating a V-shaped for its head. Two horn stars out here for the horns and its body and back. Um, we have an image on the bottom left as well with the head, horn, stars, body, and back. So to start off, we'll be revisiting um, the object of the month that I had for December, the Crab Nebula. Now, this object can be seen with binoculars under good conditions, so under dark skies away from bright city lights. Um, but in my opinion, um, a telescope is a lot better to view it with. Now, the Crab Nebula isn't the best object to observe, but it has a very interesting history. Back in 1054, it was recorded as a guest star in our sky. The Chinese stargazers recorded it as a guest, guest star, and it shined four times brighter than Venus. Um, now, it appeared in our daytime sky for several weeks and was visible in our um, nighttime sky for several months and eventually dimmed, and we weren't able to see it with our unaided eye. Now, we thought it, it was the end of its, at the end of its story, but 90 years ago, Edwin Hubble and other astronomers connected the Crab Nebula, which was a normal, which was a normal nebula, to the recordings that the um, Chinese stargazers made with this supernova, this guest star in the sky. So now we know that the Crab, Crab Nebula is the leftover gas from the supernova that we observed in 1054. I would also like to mention that in the middle of the Crab Nebula is a pulsar. It's um, the leftover of a dead star, um, and it pulsates. It rotates um, um, more than 30 times per second, and it makes the Crab Nebula a big source of radiation, radio radiation. Now, continuing on, we have some unaided eye objects. We start with the red giant star Aldebaran. Now, Aldebaran is at its dying stage in life. It is swollen and it is big 
and soon it will be cooling down and then contracting back in and it'll release those outer layers of gas and create a planetary nebula. Now in the center of that will be a white, uh, white dwarf or a, its dead star, I like to think of it as. Now you can find Aldebaran right here. It's the eye of the bull found like where the head is. Um, it's shining red, it's red eye. Now, another star I'd like to mention is Elnath, right up here. Now, Elnath is a very uh, interesting star. It's a weird star. Um, it's a connecting star, a linking star. It's part of two different constellations, Taurus and Auriga. Um, now, we only have a few of these stars in the sky, so it's worth um, noting. And in the sky, these have great color contrast. Elnath is white and blue, and Aldebaran is orange and red. We also have the Hyades open cluster. We have two open clusters. Um, I should mention that open clusters are loosely bound groups of stars. They're kind of like siblings. They were formed around the same time or in a, around the same place and have just moved apart over the years. Now, the Hyades is made of hundreds of stars and they form the, the distinctive V-shaped head of the bull, like I mentioned. <laughs> now, even though Aldebaran is around the Hyades, it is not part of them. It's only a line of sight coincidence. Aldebaran is very is very um, closer to us than the Hyades. Um, so it just appears as it's part of it. It's like two ships at sea, one far, one close, and they appear to be right next to each other, but we know that they're very far away. <laughs> we also have the Pleiades open cluster. Now, it is a birthplace of stars. It's full of young blue stars, contrasting to, again, Aldebaran, the red-orange star. Now, it is another open cluster, and I have an uh, image of it that I took around this time last year, uh, winter of uh, last year, um, with the Pleiades and uh, Venus passing by it. Also, I can't stress this enough, Binoculars. If you have a, a pair of simple binoculars around your house, um, just point it at these open clusters. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. You can see dozens of stars pop out, and I just can't stress it enough. Binoculars. <laughs> so now we have some telescopic objects. We, of course, have M1, the Crab Nebula, which I discussed earlier, right here near the Horn Star. But we also have NGC 1514, the crystal ball nebula, up here near the edge of the constellation. Um, the crystal ball nebula is a planetary nebula. It's worth noting because back in 1790, um, William Herschel, it caused William Herschel to rethink his philosophies and ideas of nebulae. Um, he, he thought that nebulae were too remote for us to resolve a sing single points of stars within them. But as you can see in this picture on the left, this isn't exactly what he saw, but this is what the nebula does look like. He could spot this single point, the single point of star in the center of the nebula with the gas surrounding it. And so that caused him to rethink um, his philosophies of nebulae. Also, I have, highlight I have um, marked some double stars in this uh, region. I have three right here. Now, double stars are just some of the best objects to, do, to observe in the sky. Um, these are telescopic objects. Double stars, the Yanidid eye, appear as a single point of light. But with sometimes binoculars, with these telescopes, they can be resolved as two or more stars. Sometimes the color contrast is just amazing with some of them. Red against blue, gold against orange, Double stars are probably some of my favorite objects to observe. Now, the last object, or I shouldn't say object, or, but location in the sky I have here is the anti-center of the galaxy. Now, this is a direction in space directly opposite to the galactic center, which is where Sagittarius A star is found, which is the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, now, this is 180 degrees opposite of where Sag the constellation Sagittarius is, of course, Sagittarius A star, and you can find this three degrees east of Elnath, which is right here. I marked it with a little arrow on my map. Um, now, keep in mind that this is an object you can view. It's just a location in the sky, a place to mark, um, a direction where it is. I would like to thank you all for watching Clear Skies and remember to keep looking up. Thank you, uh, Caitlin. Very good. I posted 
in in the chat, you know, these NGC objects, uh, a lot of them are associated with Herschel, uh, and basically his collection of observations essentially became the NGC catalog between him and uh, his son and his uh, sister. Uh, they they really originated that catalog. Okay, so now um, I'd like to introduce Rich Sanderson. Rich is the president of the Springfield Stars Club. Um, Rich has uh, got some observations uh, of recent events for us, and uh, and then also Rich, maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit about the Stars Club. Sure, Kevin. Thank you, and welcome, folks. The Stars Club is an amateur astronomy club that meets at the Science Museum. Uh, on a monthly basis and has done so uh, ever since the 1950s. The club's been around since the 30s, actually, so it's a, a pretty old club. Lot, lots of uh, enthusiastic telescope makers and amateur astronomers have been members over the years and have done a lot of public outreach and have been intimately connected with the Science Museum on, on programs and um, the observatory and different projects like that. And the club meets uh, normally on the fourth Tuesday of the month at seven o'clock uh, from September through May. But because of the Christmas holiday um, this month, um, we're going to have our meeting a week from tonight, which will be December 21st, the third Tuesday at seven o'clock. And traditionally, uh, we have a holiday meeting in December in which uh, we don't have a formal program as we do most other months, but instead um, we invite members or anybody that interested to um, show some astronomy related images of events and different things that they've done over the past year and bring in items for show and tell telescopes uh, things that they're collecting anything to do with astronomy is fine um, again that'll be at the at the museum a week from tonight at seven o'clock and um, even if you're not a, a member you're welcome to come down and join us for that and now, Kevin, if you want to queue up the images, I'm going to show some uh, sure. pictures that I've taken over the past month of some interesting things that have been going on in the sky. And it's been a pretty exciting month. Uh, there we go. If you were at AstroQuest last month, we, uh, we talked about a, a lunar eclipse that, that we've seen in the meantime. So I'll be talking about that. But I'm going to kind of do them in chronological order and, and um, begin with... Um, something that's been going on in the evening sky in the western sky that's been pretty uh, photogenic and, and beautiful uh there's been an alignment of planets and of course uh you know the planets mercury venus mars jupiter and saturn could all be seen with the naked eye in the nighttime sky uh they appear as stars of different brightnesses but generally uh, they're all easy to see with the naked eye some are brighter than others and the ones that we've been watching in the evening sky have been Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus. Um, Venus is by far the brightest. Um, in this photo that I took on December 7th, um, the crescent moon joined the three. And um, it seems like lately uh, it, it's been a story of uh, worrying about cloudy weather and predictions of cloudy weather, but then like magic, a, a clearing forms and we're able to see something for a while and then the clouds come in. And, and that's what happened on the night that the crescent moon joined um, Jupiter and Saturn and Venus. So, so on that night, there were four solar system objects all in the same view in the Western sky. Um, in this picture in the upper left is Jupiter. Uh, the bright blob at the bottom center is the moon overexposed and just above the moon, if you look a little bit above it, you see a dim star that's actually Saturn, which is the dimmest of the three planets. And to the lower right, even though it's immersed in some haze and murk uh, that's kind of bloating the image is, is Venus, which is just brilliant because it has, uh, Venus is covered with white clouds and it forms a good mirror. It reflects a lot of sunlight. So it glows brilliantly in the night sky. And it's also a, a close, planet to, to the Earth, so um, that adds to its brightness. Uh, the little inset in the upper right shows the moon the way it looked to my eye, but in order to get Saturn especially, which is kind of dim, I had to overexpose the moon in the big picture, but, but that, that was um, on December 7th. But this grouping of planets um, is continuing. I'll have a few more pictures, but you can go to the next one now. The most exciting event since we uh, met last was the the lunar eclipse, and I, I keep 
making a mistake and calling it a total lunar eclipse because I, I've seen 18 total lunar eclipses and this one looked like a total lunar eclipse. It was actually a 99% eclipse. So it was as close to total as you could possibly get without being a total eclipse. Eclipses have always um, fascinated me. Ever since I was 12 years old, I saw my first total lunar eclipse on Good Friday of 1968. And I, I was a, a budding amateur astronomer with a little tabletop telescope. And I tell you that that evening was pure magic to watch the full moon go through this transformation from a, a brilliant orb to this ruddy, dim grayish red uh, world in the sky as the moon gradually moves into the earth's shadow. And it was just, just a magical, exciting experience. And ever since that night so long ago, I've really been a big fan of eclipses of any kind, but especially lunar eclipses. And so th this eclipse was so beautiful and so exciting. And part of the reason for it is once again, all the predictions, not, not just local ones, but even AccuWeather, different predictions were calling for clouds all night long and maybe clearing by seven or eight in the morning when, when everything was over with. And so, I watched the Patriots game that evening. Uh, this was um, the evening of November 18th. Went to bed, it was raining. Set my alarm clock uh, for 1.30 in the morning and, and my alarm rang. I looked out the window, it's totally overcast. And, and I said, geez, maybe I better set it for, for 2.30 and check one more time. Um, you know, I was listening to the rain tapping on the roof of my house, but there was a quote from Mark Twain that I think is very appropriate, and I love this quote. It says, if you don't like the weather in New England now, just wait a few minutes. And that was so true for this event. It actually occurred early in the morning of, of November 19th, and when my alarm clock rang the second time, I looked out the window and, and there were the stars, not a cloud in the sky, there was the eclipsed moon. And I really had to scurry to get outside and get my telescope set up in time to get a picture of the maximum phase, which is what you're seeing right here. As I said, 99% of the moon had drifted into the darkest part of the Earth's shadow. And that's the part that appears reddish color in this picture, the, the bulk of the moon. That little piece at the bottom that's really bright is the 1% that's outside the dark part of the Earth's shadow. And that was gr glowing much brighter than the rest of it. So most of the moon was in the shadow, but just one rim was peeking outside the Earth's shadow. So it doesn't qualify as a total lunar eclipse, but I'll always remember it that way because um, that's what it looked like. And that red light that you're seeing is sunlight, even though the moon is in the Earth's shadow. And if the Earth had no atmosphere, the moon would disappear while it's in the shadow, but we do have an atmosphere and, and that air bends and, and scatters the reddish light from the sun into the shadow and it illuminates the moon when there's a total lunar eclipse. And so that's the red that you're seeing there. Uh, even though it wasn't quite total, you saw the redness of a total lunar eclipse. Next picture. Now, I, one of my hobbies is collecting old astronomy books. And this is one of my favorite books. Uh, the title's at the bottom. It's uh, written in French by uh, Lucien Rudeau who was an artist, um, book from 1937. And what this is showing is something that no human eye has ever seen. This is what a lunar eclipse would look like if you were standing on the moon. Now you saw in my last picture, the moon was reddish color. Well, this kind of explains why the moon has that color. Pretend you're an astronaut standing on the moon during the recent eclipse and the moon is in the earth's shadow. So when that happens, if you were standing on the moon, in your spacesuit, looking up in the sky, you would see the Earth covering the sun. There would be a total solar eclipse from the moon's surface. So while we're watching a lunar eclipse, an astronaut on the moon would see a solar eclipse with the moon covering the sun. And again, that's something that no astronaut has ever seen. So this painting strikes me as being realistic, but there's no photograph or, or eyewitness account of, of this. It's just imaginary but it gives a good idea of what you would probably see. The, the black disc in the sky is the silhouette of the earth. And around it, you can see like a fuzzy cloud. That's the atmosphere of the sun called the corona. 
and surrounding the silhouette of the earth is a, a reddish orange ring of light where the sunlight is bending through the atmosphere and it's illuminating the, the lunar landscape and giving it that ruddy brownish red color. And, and just like the eclipse that just happened, if you look to the right, you can see some mountain peaks glowing white. Those are the ones that are just outside the shadow. So from those peaks, you would see a partial solar eclipse. So a little bit of sunlight would be shining on those mountains, but from the red part, it would be a total solar eclipse. And you would just see that reddy, reddish glow on the moon. Next one. So when I was watching the eclipse, I was kind of in my mind, you know, imagining what if I could only uh, transport myself to the moon and look back, what an amazing sight. <clears throat> this is a wide angle picture. It was really cool because um, um, Caitlin talked about Taurus and the Pleiades star cluster. And when this eclipse took place, it was just below Taurus the bull and, and not far from the Pleiades cluster. And so I took the camera out of my telescope and I put a telephoto lens on it and was able to capture the eclipse at the bottom with the reddish color in the upper right. You can see the Pleiades star cluster in the same picture. So it was always uh, fun to see an eclipse uh, close to a, a, a landmark object in the sky like the Pleiades. Next one. And pretty soon the, the moon began to move out of the Earth's shadow. St uh, clouds began to form a little bit. A little bit of haze started forming at this point, but I was happy because I saw the maximum. But, but it's always nice to watch the partial phases. And um, you can still see that reddish glow because I overexposed the picture. Uh, the bottom part of the moon is, is um, outside the dark shadow of the mm -hmm. Earth. So standing on the moon there, you'd see a partial solar eclipse. The upper part is the red part where you'd see a total solar eclipse from the moon with that reddish glow. And what's important in this picture is you can see a, a curve. You can see the curved edge of the, the Earth's shadow. And, and in ancient times, that told astronomers that every, every time there's a lunar eclipse, the edge of the Earth's shadow is curved. And the only geometric shape that can do that is a sphere. So they knew the Earth was a sphere just by looking at lunar eclipses and seeing that curved edge of the Earth's shadow that you can see in this picture. Next one. Now this shows a comparison at the top. I, I exposed so that you could see the uh, craters and features on the moon. And of course, by uh, underexposing, in order to see the moon, you don't see the red part. In order to see the red, you have to overexpose like in the bottom picture. But in the top one, in the right, you can see a little dark ring, which is the crater Tycho and some rays coming from it. And I took that just after Tycho had, had um, come out from uh, being immersed in the Earth's shadow. Next one. Okay, the last uh, few pictures I have were actually taken fairly recently um, of the planets that I mentioned in the with the first picture. Um, Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus are still in the sky. The other night I went to the, a local playground and set up my telescope behind the school where there's a low horizon. Yeah. To see some of these things, you have to find a place that has an unobstructed horizon uh, so you can get a good view of things that are down low in the sky. And Venus is just a beacon. It's just a beacon in the nighttime. And this is uh, just a picture of uh, Venus. You can see some other stars around it faintly, but Venus is so bright with a nice silhouette of trees in the foreground. It was just a beautiful view. And next one, this is more of a wide angle shot showing um, the three planets, um, you know, a couple of weeks after that first picture I showed at the very beginning, um, they're still lined up and you can still go out and see them any, any clear night right after sunset, maybe uh, I would go out maybe a half hour or so after sunset, 40 minutes when the sky is um, in mid twilight. And you can, you can see Venus first because it's so bright. And then Jupiter, you, even though it's twilight, they're bright enough to see, but a uh, but when the sky gets darker, then Saturn, which is right in the middle, comes out, which is a little bit dimmer. Um, but isn't it cool how they're, they're lined up um, in a straight line in the, in the western sky? I urge you to go out and, and check this out. Um, you know, be, we'll be able to see this at least for the next couple of weeks um, in the western sky. And it, it shows that because the solar system is a plane, um, the planets are orbiting the sun in a plane, um, and we're on one of those planets, when we look into the night sky, all the planets seem to follow a path across the sky, which we call the, the ecliptic or the zodiac, the constellations along that path of the zodiac. But 
But all the naked eye planets, as well as the sun and moon, are found in that pathway across the sky, which um, explains why they appear lined up like this. But it's not often that you have three planets close together in one view of your camera, which is pretty neat. I think there's one more picture, Kevin, where I put the names in. There we go. That's my report for this month. And just folks get out and, and see Venus and the three planets before okay. they're, they're gone. Great. Okay, Rich, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I'm going to bring up a view of those planets here. Uh, thanks to the program Stellarium. <laughs> Kevin. Um, and this view actually is about from 530 this evening. Uh, it's pretty dark by 530. And yeah, as Rich mentions, it if you do want to see this and are like to look at planets, yeah, now is the time. Um, notice how low Venus is uh, by our next astro quest in January. Venus will not be visible. Uh, it's just look, look at how it's just getting lower and lower to the horizon every day by uh, by the onset of darkness and it's just going to be lost by early January. So uh, we, we're not going to have that and those Saturn's going to get pretty low too. Um, as a matter of fact, if we just go ahead and um, do that. It, so let's pop ahead about a month. Okay. And so notice that it's st so still at 530 and no more Jupiter by then. Um, notice that at 530, it's not totally dark anymore. Uh, this, we, we're, uh, getting, we're getting some daylight coming back to us. Uh, i have a little bit more about that in a moment, but um, uh, Venus is going to be gone. And then Saturn is just getting so low and we're starting by the time it gets dark and by the time it gets really dark it'll even be lower mercury does join the scene for the beginning of january but um you know that really bright planet show is coming to an end jupiter's still up there jupiter will still be visible um so definitely go on out and uh and take advantage uh take advantage of that i guess the other sort of night sky um well, let's head over to the eastern sky. I did want to, so looking at the east and just um, toward the east again, just as it's getting dark now, which is about 530 right now, um, here's Taurus, um, that bright star Aldebaran, that sort of V-shape there. Oh, I see that. I see that comment, uh, uh, Marguerite. We'll get to that in a moment. So the, here's, here's Taurus, the V-shape and the two horn stars above and the Pleiades star cluster um, up above that. So Taurus is going to be a great object to look for uh, for the um, really for the next few months. It's in the eastern sky now and over the next few months it'll gradually move to the southern sky and then in the spring it'll be in the western sky so uh that's going to be uh available to look and so there's the moon now it does look like in a couple of days the moon might be down near the pleiades and and um, taurus once again as it was during the eclipse so it, and then the other thing i just wanted to point out uh sort of astronomically wise uh, again noticing that you, the evening got brighter in a month. Um, we actually had earliest sunset actually occurred last week. I think it's pretty well understood that the um, short the shortest day of the year is on the solstice, but the neither the earliest sunset or the latest sunrise actually happen on the solstice, and the earliest sunset happens before the solstice. And again, as I said, that was last week. Uh, and we are actually gaining light in the afternoon so that uh, by next month, sunset will be about half an hour later than it is tonight. And as a matter of fact, uh, sunset on Christmas is a couple of minutes later than sunset on Thanksgiving. However, in the morning sky, sunrise is still getting later, and that will get later even going past the solstice. So the day will get shorter up until the solstice and then turn around and get longer again. 
Okay, so uh, there's a little, um, I don't know, bright part, bright spot to think about there. It's, as, uh, and again, this is why we have so many celebrations around the solstice as people who really were astute observers of the night sky were pretty well aware of this sort of return of the light was beginning to happen at about this time of year. Alrighty, let's go on to, oh, um, Comet Leonard. Yes, sorry about that. I almost forgot about that. So somebody asked about Comet Leonard. Uh, and you may have heard that in the news. Comet Leonard is getting, has, uh, has shown up. And I believe if I um, bring in a little bit more detail, there's uh, Comet Leonard down. Now, notice how close to the horizon that is very very close to the horizon so if you have any trees or buildings out there it's going to be a tough find last i saw uh, spaceweather.com is a really great place to look to see things like what's the latest on a comet and the last i saw is not really visible to the naked eye there's some pretty nice pictures with people just with cameras and telescopes but um, not to the, it's not really visible to the naked eye, maybe with binoculars. Uh, in the photographs, it does show a, a, a nice tail, but it's just going to be so low to the, um, uh, to the horizon. And um, let's see what happens is, so as we fast forward over the day, or there's a day, so it does get a little bit, but not too much higher. And it's always going to be skirting the horizon and skirting and also just just at the onset of darkness. It, it, it'll be a tough find. I, I, I don't want to discourage anybody from going out and having a look uh, through. It's always kind of cool to see something that's not usually there um, if you, you know, if you can spot it. So uh, good luck and uh, hopefully any, to anybody who uh, takes a look and do look for that in the next few days. Okay. Yeah, Kevin, if, yes. Kevin, if I could just interject. Um, sure. We've, we've tried to see it and we saw it one night very faintly, but um, it was hazy. But the night that I took those, the last set of pictures where I went to that low horizon site at the school, even that horizon was too high. The comet was, uh -huh, was behind the uh -huh. trees. Yeah. And it's, it's very faint. If anybody saw Comet Neowise uh, a while back, it uh, was much, much brighter than yes. Comet Leonard is. But but it's a little deceptive. People's photographic skills and technology are so far advanced that it makes even dim comets look spectacular. But it's something that you really need a lot, a, 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 an excellent hor a low horizon, a jet black sky, and, and good equipment to see. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, yeah, the photographs, I, you know, you can, the photographs are, uh, you know, half a minute exposures. Um, so you can build up a lot of light and, and see stuff. And the other thing, again, if you're familiar with brightness, um, you may hear that, uh, you know, magnitude six is sort of the limit of brightness, at least in a dark sky to human vision. Well, that's for a star. Leonard is technically brighter than a six, but it's a comet. It's spread out more than a star is and that actually makes it uh effectively dimmer um so uh but again having said all that um you know do go out and enjoy the hunt um if if you'd like to try okay so let's get on to the uh the james webb telescope um billed as the successor to the hubble and actually in planning for almost as soon as the Hubble was launched, um, they were planning, they were starting to make the plans for this telescope. There are some major differences. Um, one big difference is that the James Webb telescope doesn't really see invisible light, uh, or it doesn't see visible light, maybe make sure I'm stating that well. Uh, it sees infrared light. And so let's uh, we'll take a look at that and, and why we might want to view infrared light and, and what we um, learn from that. So you're all probably very familiar with this concept here. You take a, 
uh, you take some light from the sun, you pass it through a prism, and it breaks up into the rainbow of visible light. And these, this represents different wavelengths of energy uh, coming from the sun. Now, these particular wavelengths happen to be ones that our eyes are sensitive to. And so we, we see things that reflect these wavelengths. And we, so we call this visible light, but that's not the only energy there is. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, once again, the name comes up, William Herschel. William Herschel actually was doing a study where he would put thermometers in these different colors to see what the, uh, you know, to, to see if they had different, what, if they had different energies, which was, you know, a big question back at the time. Well, he had a, he had a thermometer up outside of the red area and that thermometer recorded the highest temperatures of all. And so he is credited with sort of the discovery of infrared, uh, infrared light, infrared radiation. And I, you know, I'll very often be lazy. I'll refer to light when really we, we, we should refer to electromagnetic radiation, which comes in a lot of wavelengths, not just the ones that we see with our eyes. So let's take a look at that. Um, the, there's our visible uh, wavelengths right there. Down below, we see that the wavelength of visible light is about the size of uh, uh, microscopic animals, protozoans. It, again, there's more out there, the sun, all kinds of things out there in the, in the universe are sending out all, this whole spectrum of wavelengths from very long to very, very short. Um, lower energy on the long side, very, very high energy on, on the short side. So if we're just looking at the visible, we're not getting all the information that we could from the things that are emitting out there. Now, as it turns out, if we look at this bar up above, this bar up above is showing us what actually gets through the atmosphere and gets down to us at ground level. So the visible wavelengths are the ones that come down. So no surprise that our eyes are evolved to detect this rate, this set of wavelengths really well, because there's not a whole lot of this area probably should be more gray instead of black. There's not a whole lot of ultraviolet that makes it down to the ground. Um, a little bit of infrared does, but a lot of it doesn't. And then when we get into the engine of microwaves and into the radio waves, yeah, and then some of that will come through. So um, if we want to see infrared, we really need to do it in a space telescope that can get up above the atmosphere. The up, but it's more than just seeing that. So here's a here's a uh, comparison down here. Here's the Hubble telescope up above. We have the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. The Hubble could see a little bit into ultraviolet through the visible and a little bit into infrared. The web is going to see a lot of infrared barely into the visible. And there's also up there now the Spitzer um, Space Telescope, which sees infrared and up to uh, into and a little bit maybe even into the microwaves. The exact boundaries of the different types of infrared and are not really clear cut or, uh, you know, etched in stone, so to speak, where, where the break off is. Well, it turns out that you know, again, if we limit ourselves to this, we're missing out on whatever this stuff has to tell us. And it turns out that the infrared has some pretty interesting stuff to tell us. First of all, it lets us see things that we just can't see. So if you look at this on the left is what might be a very familiar picture. This is the pillars of creation. This is a, a image from the Hubble, um, which, uh, it has been again made into posters and so on, and it's it's primarily visible in visible wavelength. It, it's visible wavelengths of light. There's a lot there. This is solid dust clouds here in the middle. We can't see through those. We can't see what's inside of them. And then there's just a lot of uh, gas all around them. And the star, the energy from the stars, is lighting up that gas. 
Well, it turns out it's hiding a lot of stuff from us. On the right is an infrared picture of the same area. So infrared wavelengths go right through the dust and they go right through that bright gas. And so we see that in this area, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, some of this is out beyond the net, you know, the, the pillars of creation, but there's a lot that's in that area. So each of these bright points represents a source of infrared radiation, and it's just made into a bright point on the picture so we can see where it is. Uh, we can see into these dust clouds and we can see the star that's forming inside of these dust clouds. So, uh, so by seeing infrared, it's going to let us see into things that we can't really see into very well and see what's going on in there. And besides seeing the birth of stars, also the beginnings of um, planetary systems, uh, other planetary systems beyond our solar system. Now, it turns out that infrared has a lot of interesting information that visible just doesn't have. All molecules are, as the molecule spins and vibrates, the molecule will absorb and emit energy. But it doesn't just any old energy anywhere. It's very specific levels of energy, which means it's very specific wavelengths of, radi of, of electromagnetic radiation. So it turns out, if you look at this, we see oxygen, water, methane, carbon dioxide, ozone. These are molecules that are very interesting because they are potential indicators of a living system. And they absorb light or energy at very specific wavelengths that happen to be mostly in the infrared and into the microwave, which is a little bit longer of a wavelength than infrared. Um, molecular oxygen does have a little bit of activity in the very red. Um, we see this in the northern lights, um, where we, the red a part of the northern lights is, is from oxygen, from energy given off from the oxygen molecules up in, the, in our atmosphere. But water has certain places in the infrared where it will absorb radiation. Um, carbon dioxide, very strong places where it absorbs. So um, we could find, we could learn what molecules are in those dust clouds, for example. But in this case, on this particular image, it's, it's depicting up here a, a, a star, some other star, not our sun. And around that star, there is a planet orbiting. And that planet is crossing in front of that star from our point of view. So what happens is the starlight, if there is an atmosphere around that planet, the starlight will go through that atmosphere. And if these molecules are present, it will absorb those wavelengths as we observe it coming from there. And we can detect that those molecules exist in that atmosphere. So this is something very interesting that, old, that, that infrared uh, wavelengths can give us that other wavelengths not so much. Other planetary systems will be of great interest. This one, perhaps in particular, this is an artist's representation of the Trappist-1 planetary system. Uh, Trappist, that's a star, Trappist-1, it, uh, it, and that's named after the telescope that discovered this particular system. Uh, it's actually a red dwarf star, and it has seven known planets going around it. And if you on this representation, you see close in, this is supposed to be steam. Way out here is ice crystals, and then in the middle is liquid water. There are three of these planets that exist within the what would be called the habitable zone where water could exist in a liquid form this particular um this particular system is going to be one of the targets of uh of the of the web telescope in infrared to try to detect some of those molecules but there's more
We can also see further back. We can see things that are further away and further back in time. This is a photograph from the Hubble. And what's going on here is you've got these very bright objects here. These are galaxies. This is a cluster of galaxies, a very massive cluster of galaxies. And what's happening is that the gravity of this cluster is bending the light from the things behind it. So the things that are shining behind are coming past this cluster and the light is being bent and focused in towards us. And we get to, it sort of magnifies some of these things. So these other dim things are much further away. They're a little bit magnified because of this. So um, we can see things far away and it's gonna, as it turns out, those things will be mostly infrared um because of the great distance and we think we can see that on this next image so um supposing over here on the right are all these galaxies that are really really far away we're talking about billions of light years away well that light leaves them and it travels to us and we detect it but something's going on the expansion of the universe because so this it's taking this light this 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 radiation literally billions of years to get to us and over that billions of years the universe is expanding and stretching out so that although that radiation may have started out as visible or ultraviolet radiation as it journeys towards us and through time it, as the universe expands, that light gets stretched out until in our time, it's all infrared. So in order to see further away, which means seeing further back in time, we need to look at infrared instead of looking at visible. Anything that was in visible wavelengths at that distance, by the time it gets to us, is going to be stretched into uh, infrared. So just looking down at the bottom here, uh, and there's the um, Hubble, there's the Webb telescope. And as we saw before, the Hubble just barely sees into the infrared, which means that the Hubble is not going to see too far back in time or too far out in distance because the web can see much more infrared it's going to see way further beyond and therefore way further back in time than the hubble does and it will see galaxies as they are first forming in the universe so that has potentially a lot of great interest um, uh, to to bring to us as well so we can see into dust clouds that we normally couldn't see, we can detect what the stuff is, we can detect the molecules that are in there, and we can see way back into time and to see perhaps the first galaxies forming. Now, what the heck is a Lagrange point? And why is the web going to one of those? Um, Lagrange points are named after a mathematician who solved this problem. If you look at any two bodies, in this case the Sun and the Earth, but it could be the Sun and any other planet, if you look at any two bodies, it, it, what Lagrange figured out is that there are certain places relative to these two bodies where their gravity uh, more or less cancels out and any object at that point pretty much stays there. And so these are called the Lagrange points. They're labeled on here L1 through L L5. So there's one of these Lagrange points between us and the sun. There's a solar observatory at that one that can just stare right into the sun the whole time. And, so, and again, the idea is that if something is at that point, it can orbit at that point with very, very little uh, effort. It will stay, it will pretty much just stay there. Um, there's a couple of these other points where uh, some asteroids and stuff do accumulate, uh, some, some objects accumulate. Um, there's another point opposite the sun from us, but then most important, there is a point opposite the earth going the other way 
out there, the L2 point, and that's where the web is going to be. Uh, this is it's very important to, to be here because remember it is sensing infrared which is pretty much heat the heat the infrared and heat from the earth moon and sun would just totally overwhelm any of these other signals that we would like to see of infrared so by going out to l2 and orbiting there basically it can put up a shield that blocks out the earth moon and sun at from one in one shot it can block them all at all three of those things it'll block them all out and create a shaded side that will be dark and cold here's a rel here's a little bit of the size of these telescopes the um the hubble is uh the, the Hubble in rough terms about eight feet wide, a, a little under eight feet uh, wide. The Spitzer that we mentioned before, it's up there, but it's kind of a smaller uh, width. It's a little less than three feet in width. And the web, the, the web is going to be um, a little under 22 feet in width. And so the wider the telescope, the more light it can gather, the more fainter of an object that it can see. So uh, we now we have this nice big mirror that's going to be out there gathering uh, this infrared light. And again, the idea is, well, let's see this. Actually, we can see this in a different image here. Um, it's going to get out to L2. It's going to put up this big sun shield and face it in towards the Earth, Moon and Sun. So all of that infrared that comes, it's going to hit that heat shield, it's going to dissipate the heat. And on the shaded side, it's going to be almost minus 400 degrees. And so it'll be, it'll be very sensitive to um, any infrared light that's coming in from other uh, uh, planets at other solar systems, distant objects, it's going to be able to detect that. Basically, in order to detect infrared, you've got to keep your instrument cold. Well, by going out to L2, we get that cold pretty much for free. We just have to get a big shield. And so that was one of the one of the design challenges of the web to design that shield there we go you got a shot of it here with the people basically you've got to design this shield and uh make it so that it's light but it's going to be effective at reflecting away that and dissipating that heat so that the instrument can function you can see that the scale there for people so there's going to be a lot that has to happen for this telescope to work because um, down here in the bottom, that's what it's going to look like when it's out there, but that's not what it looks like now. Okay, right now it's sitting in a rocket waiting to launch on the 22nd, and so it looks more like this, a cylinder, you know, think about a rocket, a rocket is a cylinder, and it's not very wide, so basically they had to take this whole thing and fold it up so that it fits in that cylinder, in that rocket that it's going to launch on, and then as it's journeying out to L2, and by the way, that Lagrange point, that's about a million miles away. So that's a big difference between the Hubble and the Webb. The Hubble is orbiting right around the Earth um, uh, with the right, uh, we, which we don't really have right now anymore. We had it with the shuttle, with the space shuttle, with the right craft, you can get out to the Hubble and service it, and thank goodness, because they had to do that. Um, but no hope of doing that with the web it's going to be a million miles away um so between as it's journeying out there it's got to do this incredible unfolding and stretching out job so that as it arrives there it will be fully deployed and be able to turn this shield towards the earth sun and moon and uh and provide the dark area and cold area for the infrared detection uh, to work. They, uh, NASA actually um, employs the uh, expertise of, of an origami expert um, to, to figure out a lot of stuff like this. I think we've got one last image there uh, just to show what it's going to look like out there. Um, so there it is. 
there, there's that's what it's going to look like once it's out there fully deployed. Um, we're going to hope for a lot of things to go right. Of course, they've tested and tested and tested it on the ground. It's got to go right one more time as it gets out there. So we're going to hope for the best. We're going to look forward to a lot of interesting stuff uh, coming to us from from there. So I think I've been sort of watching the chat. Did anything come up in the chat, Mike? While um, no, nope, no question. Well, I was doing that. One, I, okay. Uh, no, just the one about the comment, which you caught. Okay. All right. Great. And I and also the same with the Q and A. As far as I can see, there's nothing in the Q and A either. So, um, all right. So, uh, thanks very much to Caitlin uh, for letting us know about Taurus. Thanks to Rich uh, for those observations, and uh, and uh, thank it. Thank you to everyone for uh, dropping by tonight and uh, sharing a little bit of astronomy with us. We'll be um, back at you again next month. We're going back to the third uh, Tuesday of the month. I believe that's the 18th. This month was a little special, uh, again, because of the holidays, but actually it had turned out to be great so we could preview the web launch. Okay, so again, thanks very much for coming. We will uh, look forward to seeing you um, next time. Happy star watching, everybody. Clear skies. Have a great holiday. 